Welcome to Lakeside Institute of Theology. This is our class on Ruth and Esther. I'm Dr. Ted Rogers. Um, this is a ministry of Lakeside Presbyterian Church, and we are very, very blessed to have our graduate professor, Glenda, um, as our instructor today. So, Glenda, take it away. Good morning, everybody. Um, let us open up with prayer. I don't want to hear everybody in cyberspace. Um, let's open up in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for today. We uh, thank you that we can freely gather together and study your word. I know that that is not possible in many parts of the globe, but we are so thankful that um, we can and we pray now for your holy spirit to come upon us and teach us what you want each of us to know um, we just pray these things in your son's name and for his glory amen so last week we began with an overview of the book of ruth and we looked at the first two verses and in those two verses if you if you have your bibles um we can take a very, very quick run through on those again. Basically, we learned that Ruth takes place during the time of the judges. It's a time of moral decay, anarchy, rape, murder, you name it, <laughs> war between tribes. It was just not a pretty time. And so Ruth actually stands in contrast to the time of the judges, which uh, is going to make for a very beautiful story. We learn that um, Elimelech and Naomi, <laughs> Ted's already laughing, Elimelech, Elimelech, Elimelech. I knew Elimelech. you were doing that. <laughs> um, Elimelech, um, Naomi, and their two sons, Malon and Kilion, decide to go to Moab during a time of famine in Bethlehem. And what we learned last week is um, they went basically from the promised land into enemy territory because Moab uh, were descendants of Lot and his daughters uh, sleeping with him and they eventually become enemies of the Israelites. They get basically assimilated into the Assyrian Empire and um, they're just not well thought of. So we have Elimelech and his family moving into enemy territory during a time of famine and we discussed, um, Kevin made a really great question of, well, how do we know that this wasn't God's plan? Um, and we discussed the facts that, A, typically when it's God's plan, he announces it. <coughs> but also we will see in this first chapter, a time of repentance for Naomi. And we see that with the loss of all of her her husband and her sons, that um, she has realized that they moved there in error. So um, let's take a moment and read through, let's see, we covered the first two verses. Let's read um, three uh, through 22. So that's all of chapter one. Does somebody wanna read that for us or do you want me to read it? Go for it. Oh, you want me to read it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Now, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When Naomi heard in Moab, that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye 
And they wept aloud and said to her, we'll go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this, they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. So we have our first chapter. And remember, I was asking you guys to come up with some observations that you see on the chapter. Um, we've already discussed the meanings of Moab and Bethlehem. We saw that Elimelech's name means my God is king. Um, Naomi's is sweet and pleasant in a very sacred kind of way. Um, now let's take a look at what's going on in chapter one. So now Naomi's husband dies first. And then notice that Elimelech dies and after that the two sons die and they remain there ten years. So we know that they have been in Moab for at least 10 years. It could be more because they could have been there a while before the two sons died. Um, let me give you two meanings of names here because those are kind of hard to come by in the text unless you Google, what does Orpah mean? <laughs> so Orpah's name, ironically, means stiff-necked and stubborn. <laughs> <laughs> and that's another one of those where you go, thanks, Mom. <laughs> Ruth's name means friendship companion, right? So we have, as we saw here, then after that, about two years. So after that or then in other translations, we see that transitional uh, uh, word, Naomi's two sons die, and she's left in a dangerous position financially. So um, I have done some research on uh, Moabite culture. As far as I can tell, they did not have any laws like the Jewish law of allowing the poor to glean in the fields. So she is a woman with two grown daughters-in-law, and they have no means of financial support. So she's feeling, <laughs> quite understandably, abandoned, afraid, all of those things, right? So, um... Glenda? Yes. Do we know how old 
the girls were at this point? We really don't. I have no idea. Because they married when they were children right. sometimes. So. Right, and they could be quite young. Um, and we will see later on, <coughs> pardon me, when Ruth and Boaz get together, he always refers to her almost exclusively as my daughter. So there's a considerable age difference. Um, Boaz is probably closer to Naomi's age than to Ruth's age, but we just honestly don't know. A good question though. So Marcy was asking, what are the ages of these people? We just don't know. So Naomi sees that Bethlehem is once again prosperous and people are enjoying the first fruits of the harvest. So, um, that gets us the intro to the first chapter. Um, do you all have some observations that you picked up in those first verses? Oh, 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 dead. <laughs> I think it's really very interesting that um, Naomi says to, uh, to call me Mara, and in the next sentence, the author refers to her again as Naomi. The author Ooh, Samuel, that's good. the author uh -huh. probably Samuel, uh -huh. uh, refuses her renaming of herself. Yes, that's very good. That's a really grand observation, Ted. I know the professor. <laughs> Cyberland had made the point that Naomi wants to refer to herself as Mata, which means bitter, but Samuel, the most likely author for this, um, still refers to her as Naomi. That's a good sign of hope, actually. Mm -hmm. That's very good. Um, any me. other observations? Um, the main ones that jumped out uh, for me is uh, Ruth accepts um, Yahweh as her God. Mm -hmm. Bingo. Yeah, and the other one is. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, Why do you write that up? And something very interesting there, I will bring up now. Ruth accepts Yahweh as her God. So what's really interesting in that passage, that little soliloquy that Ruth um, says to Naomi, it's really very interesting because if you look at it, let's see, uh, your people will be my people and your God, my God. God here is translated as Elohim. And Elohim is, um, it simply means God or goddesses. So other religions actually used that term, which I thought was very, very interesting. Um, the Jews adopted it, obviously, to mean the one true God. But coming from a Moabite, I think that's very interesting that she says, your God will be my God. And then in the, almost the very next sentence, may the Lord deal with me. Lord there is Yahweh. So she has made that transition in her mind from a God to the one true God. Ted. To segue from what Kevin just said though too, she doesn't say your gods will be my gods. Mm -hmm. And the Moabites were pantheists. Yes, they were. Uh, so she's, yeah. She has adopted them. And I love that where she says, may the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely. <coughs> if even death separates you and me. So she is a Moabite that comes, as Ted pointed out and Kevin pointed out, from a pantheistic culture. And she has said, no, I'm adopting the one true God, and may he deal as severely with me 
if anything but death parts human being. I think that is absolutely beautiful. So, um, any other observations? Uh, yeah, the other one is um, Naomi's blaming God rather than taking responsibility for her husband's decisions. Mm -hmm. Very good. I've never done that. No. <laughs> Excellent observations. <clears throat> and the other one is a comparison between um, Ruth's faith seems stronger than Naomi's. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She's Naomi's pessimistic and um, Ruth is optimistic. Right. Other observations? They seem to have traveled in safety. Mm -hmm. That is really good. Mm -hmm. That's a long trek. I mean, 50 to 70 miles on foot. Two women, or yeah, two women. And um, yeah, that's a great observation, Tina. Not to mention, it's over rough terrain as well. They're going from mountains to mountains. Um, <clears throat> other observations? Okay, let me then park on a couple of things here. Um, where we have, um, let's see what this is. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she prepared to return home. Return home is a key word in this entire chapter. We see it actually, that or some form of that, nine times in just a few short verses. Mm -hmm. So... <laughs> Um, we see uh, she prepared to return home from there, um, take them back. That's also um, in a different translation. It's turning back. Um, go back, each of you. Again, it's the same word in Hebrew. Um, we will go back with you to your people. Again, same word. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. So you can see this word is, is key in this chapter. And actually what that word is translated as is repentance. Mm -hmm. So um, as we discussed in Ted's class in Acts earlier this week, um, repentance simply means doing an about face. You thought one way or you saw one way and you're going, no, nah, it's time to do the opposite. And that's what they're doing here. Um, and that, um, you know, Kevin, is, a, is um, another reason why I um, really felt like um, they left Moab um, of their own accord and not God directed. Um, they fled in fear and I think Naomi here, um, you will see, you know, as she goes, just call me bitter. She's not only repentant, she is actually feeling guilt ridden. Um, and, and though her guilt is misplaced and she's blaming God, she is recognizing that um, what they did was probably wrong in assimilating into the culture of the Moabites. So I thought that was very interesting. 
Yes, Ted. Um, the other thing, too, is you talk about assimilating into the culture. When uh, Lot uh, and his wife went to uh, Sodom, uh, they assimilated into the culture to the point that he was one of the judges. Yes. And so good. when you have that, uh, that recurring theme with the Moabites and assimilation. Mm -hmm. so. That's a very, very good point. Ted said that uh, Lot, when um, they went into Sodom, he assimilated into the culture there as well. And that um, we have that as a kind of a theme running here that um, assimilation, um, unless it's God directed, probably is not a good thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, with an exclamation point. <laughs> um, we have to understand that God's prohibitions against mi mixing with other nations wasn't truly racism. But it was an attempt to protect the Israelites from assimilating and adopting their foreign gods. So... Um, I just wanted to make that clear because um, some people can take that and run with it and say God approves of racism, and that's, that's not it at all. Um, God had rules for keeping the Moabite, Moabite, Moabites, <laughs> it's easy for me to say, out of um, temple worship. They were not necessarily forbidden to the Israelites were not necessarily forbidden to marry Moabites, but it was strongly discouraged. Um, just because the Israelites felt like the Moabites had, were, were, they were just enemies. So um, we don't know um, that Elimelech's family, Naomi, the two sons, adopted their pagan gods because clearly. Ruth's soliloquy shows that she was educated um, in the one true God and in um, Israelite uh, Jewish law. So um, I think, though, that we see that um, Naomi is repentant and she is ready to move away from her. Uh, sin and the sin of her husband and son. She's ready for something new. And um, so let's see, what else do we have in the way of observations? Um, I think it's important, not only does Ruth refer to God as Lord, which is the one true God, that is the great I am, Naomi still believes it, too. She uses the Lord in her talkings with the girls, too. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown to your dead husbands and me. May the Lord grant that each of you find rest in the home of another husband. She has not forsaken her God as the one true God, but she is, like we've all been in that place, I think, feeling possibly abandoned my God. Um, and doesn't really quite know what to do with those feelings. So, and since we're parking on may the Lord show you kindness, um, that is another key word besides repent or repentance. Um, kindness shows up a few times in this chapter as well. And that kindness is in the original Hebrew word is chesed, and kindness means actually covenant love, loyal love. So she is asking that the one true God show him, or show them, the kind of covenant love that he has shown his Israelite people. That's huge. Um, and that to me is, um, <laughs> One of the greatest blessings you can give somebody is covenant love. Um, 
So Naomi tries to send them back. Um, and we see then that Orpah agrees. And in a way, I, I, I know she gets a bum rap. She's stiff-necked. She goes back to her gods, blah, blah, blah. But in a way, she's honoring Naomi's request. So I don't know that we can just, you know, completely write her off, although you never hear about her in scripture again, so who knows? <laughs> but, um, but Orpah turns back and Naomi clings to her. I just love that. She just clings and will not let go. Um, Did you check out that, uh, the root of uh, that word in Hebrew? No, I didn't, but I can check on that. Ted asked if I had checked on the uh, root word of cling. Um, let me see if I did put it in here. If Belva was here, she'd know it. She would know it. I know. <laughs> she knows Hebrew. Um, oh, the other thing that she does that I really appreciate about Naomi is she gets us thinking about the leverate law, okay? So um, when she's talking to them about, I'm too old another, to have another husband, even if I had a husband and, get, they gave, and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grow up? So let's talk about Leverate Law for just a sec. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, somebody, could somebody, Ted, would you do this for me? Would you look up Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 10? has no son the widow of the dead man shall not be married to a stranger outside the family her husband's brother shall go into her take her as his wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her and it shall be that the firstborn son that she bears will succeed to the name of the dead brother that his name may not be blotted out of Israel but if the man does not want to take his brother's wife then let his brother's wife go up to the gate to the elders and say, my husband's brother refuses to raise up a name to his brother in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Then the elders of the city shall call him and speak to him. But if he stands firm and says, I do not want to take her, then his brother's wife shall come to him in the presence of the elders, remove his sandal from his foot, spit in his face, and answer and say, so shall it be done to the man who will not build up his brother's house and his name shall be called in Israel, the house of him who had his sandal removed. That's pretty big judgment, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so actually laws similar to this existed among the Hittites um, and other Near Eastern cultures. There, it was kind of a common practice that if a woman's husband died, then she could try to have a son by his brother. Right? And that would be raised up in the dead husband's name. However, <laughs> that's where the difference or the, the similarities stop. Because in the Hittite culture, there were no negative consequences if a guy didn't want to do it. In Livre Law, his name is basically blotted from the books. Um, and, and she gets to publicly spit in his face if he does not want to uh, handle this. The way that um, the way that the law requires. Tina. What if she already has children from the, the deceased husband? Ooh, that's a good question. I don't know. Do you know? Ted? I do not know. Um, Tina just question. asked a really great question. What if she already has sons by the husband? Um, I would suspect that it would not apply because then she would have sons that would help to take care of her. But I'll have to look that up. I'm not entirely sure. 
And you hit on one of the important parts there because the, it's the importance of having a son is that, that she has somebody to take care of her in her old age. Exactly, exactly. Got one um, more. Pardon me? Got one more. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, if he, what if the brother already has a wife? That would be that would have been forbidden. It would have gone to a, a husband who did not have a wife because polygamy was not uh, uh, was not accepted in but Jewish law. David has wives. Oh, yes, and, this is very true. And Solomon took it to an extreme. <laughs> yes, he? he did. But it's really it's not. They're not supposed to be polygamous, if I recall correctly. Yeah. So. Um, you're spot on, Tina. And I usually, in a situation like that, then it goes to the next closest kin. Cousin. Right. Cousin. Right. So, um, but yeah, you're right. There are exceptions to those rules. Like David, Tina asked, um, what if the, the brother is already married? Ted. I'm going to say that there, there's so much drift so quickly because in the beginning of Genesis, God says the man shall leave his mother and father um, prior to marriage and uh, by the time I mean just a few generations later it's the woman uh, leaving and going to the man and living in the man's house mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so so things things yeah, drift things drift we're, we're human we screw up and 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 Tina made the point, David and Solomon both had multiple wives, and, and she's spot on, they did. Um, <laughs> we have a tendency to make our own laws. Um, at any rate, the, uh, the main point of the Liberate Law was to make sure that the women were left with a way to survive. Because in the laws in the Pentateuch, we, we find very quickly, God cares a great deal for widows and orphans. They are huge. Um, he wants to make sure that they are taken care of, and this was a way to do that. Um, so we have the Liberate Law. Um, let me see what other observations I came up with. Yeah, as Kevin pointed out earlier, um, Naomi says, it is much more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has come out against me. So we see, she's referring to him as Lord, the Almighty. Um, she still believes in a sovereign God, but um, she- Tom, Tom says that in his notes. Yeah. That, that some believe that she's actually acknowledging the, the total sovereignty of God. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm exactly. And also a disobedience. Exactly. It all went terribly because it was, she acted in disobedience. Exactly. Um, Kevin's making a really good point that, um, well, yes. Tom's. I don't want to take it anywhere. Like <laughs> no, no, yes, it yeah. was in Tom Constable's notes. She is still recognizing that God is sovereign. But she is also recognizing that, um, or she believes that God's judgment is upon her. And we'll discuss that when we get into interpretation on this, because um, I think it's pretty interesting. Um, she, uh, she, but the beautiful thing about it is if you look at that and you look at how she wants the Lord to show kindness, to Ruth and Orpah, she's feeling like the punishment is on her. She doesn't want it extended to her daughters. And that is a beautiful picture to me. Grace. Yeah, she's extending grace and she wants God to extend grace to the daughters. And that, um, I can't help but think that God smiled at that. <laughs> um, so let's see, what else do we have? Naomi ironically says to no longer call her sweet, but Mara bitter because she is suffering God's judgment upon her. Um, we already pointed that out. Um, I love Ted's point that the author still calls her Naomi though, and that's pretty hopeful. 
So, and then the final, I think it's the final, no, I've got two more. The other observation that I came up with is irony. I love irony. <laughs> is that opposite of wrinkly? Yeah, exactly. Tegos is that opposite of wrinkly. Irony. Bethlehem was empty and experiencing famine in the land when Naomi and her family left Bethlehem. And it seemed like the world was her oyster. And here now we see she returns to, so, and she leaves full. She returns to Bethlehem um, and Bethlehem is full, but she is empty. She is soul empty and she is food empty. Um, the other irony, of course, is she leaves during a food famine and she comes and returns with a soul famine. She, re she leaves during a food famine and returns when there is a, a plentiful harvest coming in. Um, and she thinks she's returning empty, but I love, love, love that last verse in chapter one. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law. Arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. And that to me is hope. She thinks she's returning empty, but she's got Ruth. And Ruth is going to be an amazing savior for her. Dead. And it's an echo of first fruits. Exactly, exactly. Ted's, <coughs> pardon me, Ted makes the point that it is an echo of first fruits. So um, with the barley harvest, then comes the wheat harvest and other harvests, and it will end up in the feast of first fruits, which we now call Pentecost. And, um, and so once again, we have that beautiful picture like we saw in Acts, um, you've got in Acts the people coming to know Christ by 3,000 and 5,000 and all of that. And it happens during the first fruits. It happens right during Pentecost. And we see the same thing here. We have Ruth coming back during first fruits. And, um, and Ruth saying, your God will be my God and may the Lord deal worse for me if I ever from you, or if death ever separates us. Could you say with that then, when you return to God's will, He then blesses you? Because mm -hmm. that, that last verse, she's repented, she's come back, mm -hmm. and now everything's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, and I think that that's true. I think God's blessings are going to... But when you act against His will, it all turns out terribly. Mm -hmm. But you then, you can repent and come back in alignment with God's will, and then Right. As well. Kevin's making the point that um, when we go outside of God's will, um, we we basically reap what we sow. Um, we think that <laughs> every pun intended. Every pun intended. Um, when we are disobedient, God oftentimes will allow us to deal with the consequences of coming out of that sin, um, but. When we repent, we enter back into um, the blessings of God. We enter back into fellowship with Him. It is that, um, that act of saying, not my will, but yours be done. It is coming into recognizing that God is sovereign. Um, his will is perfect. It may not look like what we want it to look. Oftentimes it doesn't. <laughs> but that's where trust comes in and that's where faith comes in. So good point, Kevin. It also seems to show to me that the punishment is not a like a severe punishment. God just allows you to, it's like, okay, if that's what you want to do, off you go. Exactly. And then you reap what you sow. There's a certain 
you know, cause and effect actions and consequences, and mm -hmm. if that's what you want to do, then okay, I'll you. let you do it. Uh -huh. free will. And you are your consequences. That's free will. Free will, exactly. Tina so makes it's not punishment point. as a, you know, a Yeah, um, Kevin makes the point that um, um, it's, it's not necessarily that God is doing this with us, He's letting us reap the consequences of, of our decisions. And as Tina points out, that's because God gives us a free will to do that. God it's like didn't, letting a child learn by their mistake. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. God didn't want automatons. He doesn't want people that, you know, um, that he works like puppets. He gave us a free will to think for ourselves. And we, he allows us to make those decisions that are probably outside of his will, but it is a process of growth for us. It is a process for us to go, oh, my way was not the best way, was it? <laughs> <laughs> and to come back into alignment with God's will in trust and in faith. So, um, any other thoughts? Those are great, guys. You guys are awesome interacting with the text like that. So, in light of that, then, let's look at interpretation. In light of what we know about God and how we should trust him for our daily bread, was Elimelech right to leave Bethlehem to travel into the enemy territory? We kind of covered this last week. But um, when has that ever gone right for the Israelites? <laughs> <laughs> Seldom. Um, and, and I think we can see here it doesn't go well. Um, so our story starts off as dismally as the book of Judges ends. Mm. That's um, a good observation. Yeah, it, I, if you look at the book of Judges, oh my gosh, it just looks like hell on earth. And, and so it starts off pretty dismally, but we find in the first chapter that God never gives up on his people. He made promises he will never give up on them. Um, it is the constant plight of the Israelites to trust God, and then, and especially in the time of the judges or you look in the wilderness, it is the constant plight of the Israelites to trust God, then experience prosperity, and then turn our backs on them when everything's going great. Oh, we're doing hell. We don't need them. Um, whether we actually say that or whether we just get so busy. For me, it's, I just get so busy. Um, or to experience hardships and walk away from him. But what do we know about God's role when all of this is going on? Thoughts? He hasn't given up on us. Exactly. Exactly. Forgiveness is always ready when we come back to him. God's perfect will and permissive will. What does this first chapter say about that? We've kind of touched on that, Kevin, with, you know, permissive Ted. I was going to say for our audience, uh, cyber audience, can you define the difference between permissive will and uh, perfect. perfect will? So perfect will is when we are living in obedience to God and everything is firing on all eight. <laughs> and um, God is working out his will. Permissive will is what we were talking about with Kevin when um, God will allow us to make those decisions. We have a free will. Um, and the beautiful thing about the permissive will and this is just my opinion, but um, I think you can back it up with scripture. It, and even here with Ruth, um, in God's permissive will, when we're screwing up, God can still use it. And he still does. Um, God has always given us a choice from the moment Adam and Eve made the choice to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Consider the history of the Israelites. <laughs> How many times um, did they stray? How many times do we stray? 
Um, and consider how Jesus responds to the rich man who kept all of God's commands but would not give it all up to follow Jesus. He always gives us a choice to follow and trust him or to go our own way. This is why I think Elimelech and his family's choice to leave the promised land and go to Moab was not God's perfect will, but it was his permissive will. And it is ultimately what leads our God to the cross. Okay. And I think also when you see that, um, when we screw up, when bad things happen, uh, when we repent, when we turn back to face God again, and while we have our ashes, we can hand those to him, and he returns a garland of beauty. He does. He does. Spot on, Ted. When we um, come back to him after a time of falling out, um, and we have nothing but ashes, we can lay them at his feet, and he gives beauty for ashes. I love that. It's one of my favorite verses. So. What verse is that? Oh my gosh, uh, it's, is it in Isaiah, Ted? I'm trying to recall. I'll look it up for you. Yeah, I don't um, recall right off the top. He gives beauty for ashes, strength for fear. Um, yeah, so I will look up that verse for you, Kevin, and get back with you. Um, that will be in the comment section on the video. Yes, it will be in the comment <laughs> section on the video, along with, what was that? The, um, uh, the Hebrew word used uh, when Ruth clings to Naomi, and um, also about what if the um, brother has, or what if the uh, woman has sons already by uh, her dead husband. So I'll look all that up for you and get back with you. Oh, okay. please, don't fall. Um, I will say um, one of the challenges of the Israelites is it wasn't just to remain where they, you know, they trust God for what they need, but also to remain faithful because they kept going off into idolatry mm -hmm. right through the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. um, whereas Naomi, <coughs> even though everything turns out terribly, she doesn't do that. She stays, she stays faithful. She does. Mm -hmm. And then everything turns around mm -hmm. for the good. Mm -hmm. Which God always um, works everything out for the good of those who love him. Mm -hmm. So she, she, even though she was hurt um, and bitter, she, did, she still loved God and stayed faithful. Exactly. And then he blessed her at the end. He does. Yeah. You're right. Um, Kevin made the point that the Israelites all through the Old Testament were always disobedient, but Naomi remains faithful to her God, and that's very clear in this um, first chapter. She's not really happy with him, but she <laughs> remains faithful. So, Ted. To, to segue from, to, from your point, Kevin, and I think one of the things that, that we see that's so beautiful in this, in this book is that we think, tend to think of God's blessing as an event instead of a process. But more often Ooh, than not, good. it's a process instead of a singular event. Mm -hmm. I love that, Ted. That's a great interpretation here. Ted made the point that God's blessings, um, when we do repent and come back, um, we, we want to think of it as a single event, but it's not. It's a, actually a process. And I think that's very true because um, he is always about having us and helping us grow in him and grow in our faith in him. And so it becomes a beautiful dance, really, mm -hmm. with God. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I love that. Yeah. It's a real parent child love. It really is. It really is. Um, oh, well, how many times were you just so frustrated with your kids? Growing up and doing something, putting their hand on the stove or hot stove or whatever. But you recognize that your love for them is so great and you want just the best for them. And so it's a lot of, it's a lot of learning. It's a lot of going back and forth. And God, fortunately, is always faithful. So I love that. So what does this say about the consequences of poor decisions? <laughs> 
Is Naomi right in assuming God is judging her? Or could he simply be allowing her to suffer the consequences of her poor decisions? I think we've kind of covered that. Have we in the past assumed rightly that we have a wrathful God who punishes us at every turn? I was taught for most of my life when I became a believer, after I became a believer, that the God of the Old Testament is a wrathful God. I don't think that's true. <laughs> that was the biggest thing I got out of the uh, Pentateuch. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. Kevin's saying that's the biggest right. thing he got out of the Pentateuch. Mm -hmm. God's not wrathful. <laughs> We're just disobedient. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I hated, I, I, now that I look back on that, all those years of, I think, being mistaught, um, God's not a wrathful God. He never has been. Um, Lazy scholarship. Yeah, exactly. Ted said lazy scholarship. Um, <laughs> I put down here, could we possibly be blaming God for our stupidity, our <laughs> pride, our desire to be in control of our own lives? Everything I know about God is that he is the God of love. Meeting out his wrath is the last thing he ever wants to do. I mean, you can look at Noah. Um, look at how we recognized uh, or agonized with Abraham on destroying Sodom and Gomorrah. He didn't want to do it. He doesn't want to um, become this wrathful God. Um, look at how he tarries now. All of my life as a Christian, I was taught that the God of the Old Testament was a God of wrath. But what do we see here when Naomi decides to repent and return home? And that's hope. God um, meets her where she is. Yes. God does, that's a great point, Ted. God meets her where she is. And so the first chapter ends with hope. And what do you think this says about God's devotion to his chosen people and promise? He will always fulfill his promise. The nation of Israel is his chosen nation. He has plans for them in the future, just like he has plans for us. And the beautiful part that we are going to see here in Ruth is that um, his plans include both Jews and Gentiles. And his plan includes using both men and women. And that is um, I love that. I love that it ends with, um, although Naomi doesn't see it, her quiver is full with the gift of Ruth in her life. So, um, any other thoughts? So, as we remember in the first, um, in the first class, we talked about uh, Howard Hendricks quote on um, you know, uh, observation and interpretation without application is like performing an abortion on scripture. So um, I'm not going to ask you guys to share your applications because I know that can be very personal. Um, but for me, I will just tell you what, <laughs> I'll tell you my applications. We'll just lay it all out on the line because we learn from one another. Um, first question, when, I have take, when have I taken matters into my own hands to supply my needs instead of trusting for God's daily provisions? Um, plenty. I'm just going to say too numerous to count. Um, I like to be in control. <laughs> Secondly, <laughs> how many times have I felt like Bruce Almighty when he <laughs> blames God for all of his woes and asks God to smite me, almighty smiter? <laughs> it's easy to get angry with God, blame him or even someone else when things aren't going our way. But like Naomi, we can become bitter and despondent broken and contrite over what we have done and still trust that the sovereign God will do what he must to bring us back into the fold. 
that is repentance. Um, we are promised in Psalm 51, 17. Oh, there you go. Well, no, that's a different one. Psalm 51, 17, a broken and contrite heart God will not despise. What was that, sorry? Psalm 51, 17. Thank you. You have your uh, New King James? Mm -hmm. Would you mind looking up ashes for me in the... Oh, do you... Oh, is that, that's not a study. Okay, never mind. Yeah. Um, well, I'll look it up later. Um, so, so I've got a study by wood. If I look up ashes, it'll tell me what. It should give you, yeah, it should give you a, a reference. Um, beauty for ashes. I don't know why I'm thinking it's like Isaiah or Jeremiah. Um, I was thinking Psalms, man. Were you thinking Psalms? I mean, I've, been, I've been wrong before. No, I have too. <laughs> Just one. <laughs> Thank you, Tina, for that vote of confidence. <laughs> this is not exhaustive, so okay. I don't have it. Okay, never mind. So I will look that up and get back with you. Um, third application. Uh, I always draw from my experiences in, li in life, so this one's kind of funny, too. Can I be more like my dog who, when he's done wrong, comes immediately to me, sits, and looks up at me with the eyes of absolute contriteness, trust, and love? <laughs> I have a tendency to live in denial for a little bit. <laughs> um, and then the final application is, what can I do to be more like a Ruth to my friends who comes alongside in devotion and becomes a bulwark for them and the method God uses to bring her blessing. Um, in this day and age, there seems to be a sense of global depression, what David Brooks calls existential loneliness. The world is looking for a savior right now. It, it really is. Um, it, the fields are ripe for harvest. Um, I think people understand that our planet is dying. Um, people understand that we have kind of raped and pillaged this planet. Um, I think people are full of anger, bitterness, despondency, depression, and fear. So this is a time that we can come alongside these people with a hope that won't disappoint. And we are called once again, as Ted is teaching in Acts, to be love in action. Um, we are tasked with the Great Commission, and I think now it is more important than ever. Um, this is the time when we can come to them not with judgment or condemnation, but simply love them with the love of Christ. So those were my applications. Um, any other questions? Cool. Why don't I close this in prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you for this time together um, to study your word and um, not just learn what's in the text, but um, hopefully by not quenching the Holy Spirit within us, take from it what you would have each of us to know and to apply and incorporate into our lives. Heavenly Father, we pray that we might go forth um, with um, your strength, your grace, and your mercy to reach a world in need, starting right here in our own hometown. Um, we thank you and we love you. It's in your son's name we pray, amen. amen.